everybody, it's Dina Blizzard and this light is very hot tonight and we are in the kitchen. It is not a Tuesday. So if you are watching this and saying, what? Why is Dina Blizzard live on a Monday? Uh, and it's because we have started a new show called Sip, Share, Advocate. This is our second official show. So uh, perhaps you have watched one of our previous shows uh, with Dr. Dr. Richard Selznick, which was fabulous. Uh, tonight, we are going to be featuring uh, a great new friend, uh, Riza Miro Lemonakis. Is that right? <laughs> Am I saying it right? Um, and she has uh, helped us on our journey with Brooke, and so she'll be uh, joining us in just a second. If it's the first time you're joining us, uh, know that this show is a little different than Tipsy Tuesday, although it's Sip, Share, Advocate, and we all will have our wine, and you can be drinking whatever you would like. Um, tonight's show is all about special needs and advocating, and uh, I am a big believer that uh, when moms and dads can share information and we can get experts to come in and sit here uh, to kind of share their stories and share their expertise um, and get questions from you guys. Uh, so if you are watching and you are a parent of a special needs child in any way, or if you know a parent, please tag them, share this video. Um, you know, tonight is all about being able to bring experts into your homes and to say, hey, here's straight talk. This is moms to moms, um, just kind of talking and um, saying, here's what I'm experiencing, here's what helped. Um, and so we're super excited. So it's our second show. Welcome to Ship, 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 Ship. I can't say it right. It's Sip, Share, Advocate. I'm gonna, it's gonna roll. It's gonna roll. I don't, I don't know if everybody likes that title. Do you like it? Anybody? We'll talk about that at the end of the show. All right, so joining us tonight, she is uh, not only a speech therapist, but she has specialties in many areas. Tonight, we're talking about social skills. So again, if you um, have any children that are kind of dealing with anything that perhaps makes them different or deal with other kids in a different way, uh, tonight's show might be for you. So uh, so help me welcome Riza Miro Lemonakis. There it is. I'm going to get it. Am I saying it right? Lemonakis? Yes, okay, you are. Good. All right. So this is Riza, everybody. And uh, Riza, uh, we met actually on our journey with Brooke Blizzard. Um, and uh, she was interested. I forgot. I forget how I found you. If it was through the school or through somebody else. It, well, I'm not sure, but the school contacted me. And okay. it was the quickest, I, I have to tell you. Uh -huh. I do a lot of third-party independent evaluations. Uh -huh. And usually it takes months to get them approved. Mm -hmm. And um, yours you know, they called <laughs> and, they were like, and they said, you were requested, here we go. And I had, you know, right. everything I needed within a couple of days. All right. So uh, you did something right. I must have done something. <laughs> so you were board certified, New Jersey licensed mm -hmm. speech language pathologist. So right. first, um, introduce yourself like your professional introduction to everybody. Oh, I have to do that? Yeah. Okay. Tell me who you are and okay. all your, all your big credentials oh, and uh, experiences. What do you got? Wait, the time you brag. Um, so my name is Riza Miro Lemonakis. Um, I own Riza Miro and Associates, so it's a private um, outpatient facility. Uh, we have speech therapy, um, occupational therapy, and tutoring with reading specialists. Um, we have 19 people in our staff who is just, they're all wonderful, um, but they all have their little niches. So um, depends on what a child needs, you know, they come in and um, I figure out when to match them and who to match them with. I have also been a featured speaker um, for other professionals, other parents, and um, I've been, um, I spoke at a Pennsylvania uh, speech and hearing convention about social skills. Look at you, you're so fancy, and she's in the kitchen. All right, so before we get started, so can you tell us like some other like just general fun info about you? Like what is something like, okay. besides all these great things that you do? I like people to like get um, to know you. I grew up in the Philippines. So you did? I did. Until how old? Until 13. Until the, and uh, what language do they speak in the Philippines? That's Tagalog. Do you speak it? I do, fluently. Mm -hmm. So I moved say here. Say something, like, say <laughs> something. What does it sound like? Um, I don't know. I guess I don't know what it sounds like because it's, it's, uh, I understand it. Say, like, Dina, I like your house. It's not as messy as I thought it would be. Say okay. that. Um, Dina, napakaganda ng bahay mo, hindi masyado magulo. That sounds beautiful. That, what does it sound like? I don't does know. It sound like, it's sa I don't. I didn't understand. It's kind a of word like a combination saying. of Spanish with the native Filipino language. Mm -hmm. So you know, there's a lot of words that we use that are from. So when you came here at 13, you didn't know any English. I knew some from school, awesome. um, but I didn't speak it fluently. And then um, when you come to a different country, 
it's very fast, so you can't really understand it. Because you're full everyone, immersion, yeah, right? Everyone talks so fast. And do you find, because I have Filipino in our background. I don't, I don't know if I told you that, Risa. Yeah, so yeah. my grandfather is Filipino and Spanish. <gasps> okay. And my, if my mom or dad was here, they could tell you um, where we were from, but oh. I don't remember. Okay. But my dad has found all of our Filipino cousins. So when, when um, my grandfather came here, his name was Karuben Lahato, mm -hmm. and when he registered at Ellis Island, he didn't think he would get a job because it was such an ethnic name. Right. So he turned Karuben into his uh, last name, Kerbin, and took on the American name Bob, <laughs> and then <laughs> essentially took away all of our heritage. Wow. So okay. my dad has found all of our Philippines, and he's, he's like, Dina, that we're all going Did to the Philippines do that on a plane. Did he Ancestry.com No, no. So, kind of so it's my grandfather's brother's children so okay. he kind of knows them okay. kind of but either way he's getting on the plane and he's going to the philippines with well, them. you know be be um prepared it's a long flight is it <laughs> oh it is it's exactly halfway around the world so then it's um right now about 22 hours with you know one layover are your children bilingual um they're not i wish they were but why they, didn't you force were... them to learn this um i did and then they could understand it for a little bit and then they said and then they were screw done. with that and then <laughs> that was it. kids ruining everything <laughs> right, right. all right well that's not very interesting all right so yeah. tonight so even though you are uh, from that kind of speech and language mm -hmm. uh area um you said you some of your major specialties are in social skills so yes. tell everybody more about that part so social skills is really my love um I just happened upon it so when I first started my practice it was a lot of you know what you usually think people go to speech therapy for um, articulation language therapy um, you know if they if they have difficulty with understanding language and talking um, you know we did feeding and we still do all of that and I still do all of that but I found this need for social skills and I found it interesting because it comes so naturally to some people and it doesn't need to be broken down and yet I kept seeing all I kept coming across all these children that had difficulty doing these things and then I started trying just for my sake to be able to teach them to try and break it down and then it became okay let me break it down because other kids also needed it so it's one of the things that kind of it's not inclusive to one diagnosis I find that all of the kids that are coming for it are coming from so many different Backgrounds. Oh, so in when we've previously spoken, you mm -hmm. talked about um, you have a specialty in apraxia, and somebody mm -hmm. just said that her son has. What is apraxia? Because because mm -hmm. you told me three things. One yeah. was language processing. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, two of the things I knew. I don't have my notes here. And but that's apraxia. The other is apraxia. So right? what is apraxia? So apraxia is a motor coordination disorder. So it's essentially a child knowing what they want to say, and then they take that message from their brain, and then they send. Um, neural messages to their mouth to move to be able to say what they want to say and there is a disconnect from the brain to the mouth and then the mouth doesn't go where it's supposed to go so it's highly frustrating um, so for children um, their receptive language their ability to understand language is typically within normal it's range fine. sometimes a lot higher mm -hmm. but their expressive language is so much lower but and, how, do, how what does that look like to to you like how like I don't even know that I would how do how do parents know that that's a problem so one of the red flags would be a lot of tantrums honestly so when a child is about two or three mm -hmm. um, and then you know a parent will call us and say hey you know my child's not talking or they only have 10 to 20 words at three years old and I think we're starting to get concerned and then we evaluate the child and the child knows everything understands everything so he understands you know two-step directions he he gestures a lot you know he he lets his needs met and be known mm -hmm. by everything else but talking mm -hmm. but every time they try to talk it's just either nothing comes out or the wrong thing comes out um, so then we start suspecting apraxia. Now, I'm going back to that, I, mm -hmm. I saw her while you were talking, but she said her, her child had apraxia, mm -hmm. but that she was using equine therapy. Mm -hmm. Do you know about that? So um, apraxia, all apraxia means is the absence of movement. So praxis is movement. So apraxia is just the absence of movement. Okay. So for grown-ups, when you know, I used to work geriatric, mm -hmm. um, the meaning of it would be usually post-stroke. So if you had a stroke, and the area of your brain for um, uh, speech there, uh, speech development kind of gets a little um, injured, so you have now a difficulty talking. Right. Um, so for children, it's essentially the same, but without the trauma. So right. they're just they're just born with it. So usually, a lot of things that need movement. So equine therapy wouldn't hurt at all because you're trying to get them motor coordinated. 
Interesting. And so is it is it a, is it their ability to move their mouth or is it is it is it related to anxiety? Like I guess I no, not related to anxiety typically. So it's um, considered neurological. So yes, it's their ability to coordinate the movements in their mouth. So. Interesting. All right, I'm trying to get this lighting right because it's either too dark or too bright. So I'm gonna just go ahead. Yeah, take a sip. Okay. So, um, so you said. So we're gonna go back because we're talking tonight about social <laughs> skills. If you have any questions, you can put them up, and we can. Um, <laughs> yeah. So yes. Chardonnay is counter mm -hmm. uh, coordinating. So <laughs> it is. That's why we do this show. Um, so you said that you, when you're talking about the kids that you're seeing with social skills problems, mm -hmm. it's across everything. So it could be somebody that you know, comes from ADD or apraxia yeah. or, so talk a little bit more so about So there's that. been definitely a shift. So I felt like 15 years ago when we would do social skills therapy, it was almost inclusive to one diagnosis, mainly for pervasive developmental disorders. Um, typically children who have a, one of the characteristics that they have is significant social difficulties. Um, but what I've been finding the last five to seven years is that you know, parents are coming to us and it's always that parent gut, that mom gut. Mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. know, something is off, something is wrong, they don't have a diagnosis, or they might have a diagnosis of ADHD. So, you know, other diagnoses that typically don't warrant or historically didn't warrant mm -hmm. um, speech therapy. Right. And then we start looking into this and it's almost like social skills is the outcome of it. Difficulty with social skills is the outcome. So I'll give you an example. If a child has ADHD and they tend to be impulsive, so they tend to be already you know, in the midst of things all the time, so then they miss social cues. Hmm. So then they have social difficulties. So if I have a child who has anxiety, and it might be anxiety you know, educational-wise, they might have a specific learning um, disability, mm -hmm. then they start isolating themselves from their friends. Let's see what's happening right here. <laughs> Not even gonna address the fact that there's some, Reza, this is my husband. Uh, husband, this you? is Reza. This is Jim. Reza. <laughs> yep, just nothing, nothing going on here. Corona, nothing right? going on no, here. Your just, wife is making me drink wine. <laughs> she's having some yeah, Chardonnay. she's making me drink wine, so I, I think I'm going to not mix tonight. Just go about your business, Jim. <laughs> um, just nothing happening here. Okay, that's okay. So that's kind of the case. So we are starting to see where the outcome is the same, where they have difficulty, you know, developing friendships or, mm -hmm. you know, being, um, feeling, increasing their self-esteem or having a good positive mm -hmm. um, self-image, yeah. and, but they're coming from different backgrounds. And I, you know, um, we're coming from more of that anxiety, mm -hmm. uh, learning issues, um, and uh, yeah, there was definitely a time, and I think that, you know, parents kind of know, you start to hear those same things, you know, how come how come I don't have any friends mm -hmm. or, you know, right. so-and-so is mad at me now. And you're like, well, what did you say? Right. Did you say this? You know? And so, um, somebody had written while you were speaking mm -hmm. that, is it possible to, I think she said her, her son is 14. Mm -hmm. Um, can you be 14 and, and have a practice? She goes, he has temper tantrums all the time. Anytime she says no, mm -hmm. can, can, I mean, I've just never heard of apraxia. Like, mm -hmm. can it, I don't know dog wants to go out. Is it possible to, be undiagnosed? It is possible to be undiagnosed at that age. Um, depends on the severity. So I have children with mild apraxia that mm -hmm. you probably wouldn't have known. Um, it probably presents as more of an articulation mm. disorder. Mm. Um, but then I have ones, usually moderate to severe apraxia, we'll know by about three to five. Wow. Yeah. All right, so let's go to uh, some of the questions. Sure. So some of the things we're going to talk about are some uh, social milestones for elementary, middle, and high school. Mm -hmm. uh, some signs, when do parents need to be uh, concerned mm -hmm. is tonight. And uh, what are some first steps to take if you think that your child has some social issues? Um, and we'll talk about some resources. So some social milestones. So let's talk about elementary. I feel like that elementary school time is when parents start to know notice mm -hmm. something is not quite right here, right? right? So if you take anything from tonight and this talk, what I really want to kind of stress is think of a playground and think of from preschool to about second grade, you can kind of see the kids and when you put a bunch of kids preschool to second grade into a playground, they scatter. Yep. They're like little islands. Mm -hmm. And, that's and what they they're cluster, right? Yeah, yeah, and that's what they're supposed to do. And then roughly around first grade to second grade, then they start kind of following each other. But they follow each other, they can't sustain it. So they follow each other like schools of fish and then they separate and then they come together again later on. As they grow older, then they just start following each other. 
so they they really rarely separate and the reason for that is when you you know when a child is young when they first start doing it they are very um uh they just care about themselves they're independent they're, you know they they want the parallel play because they don't really care about the other people around them they care about the toy or the swing or the video game or whatever it is but as they grow older then it starts shifting because then you shift from parallel play to interactive play when you're actually interacting with someone. So you're concerned more, less about the ball and more about what you're going to do yes. with the ball. So for social skills to be on the right track, the toy has to eventually lose value because the company has to eventually mean more to a child than the toy. So are you saying so that there are for some for kids that, that never happens for the toy... Kids. The toy is always the most important. Yes, the toy or the TV show or the game. So that is what they are focusing on. And then it ends up being they're going to, all of their behaviors will center around that. So I'll give you an example. You know, if I have a child that likes to play with a ball a certain way, mm -hmm. and, you know, in kindergarten, totally fine. If he doesn't want to share the ball, totally fine. You're, you know, mm -hmm. you're five, you're six. Um, and then they start growing up and then all the second graders are saying, oh, do you want to play basketball? Sure. Oh, but you don't want to play basketball? Let's play football. Sure. Because it's not about the ball anymore. Mm -hmm. So the child who cares about the ball will be isolated because now he doesn't want to play with the other kids with football because he can't transition there because he just wants the ball. Mm -hmm. So now, you know, he's at a crossroads and going, do I keep playing with this basketball or do I join them? And if... They, if the social skills are not developing the way we want them to develop, they will stay with the ball. Well, let me ask you, is there ever, uh, is it ever not about the ball and it, it just be about a kid that just wants to be left alone? Is that something different? Absolutely, but... Because I feel like I've seen on the playgrounds, mm -hmm. you know, you'll see all the kids over there and then one kid mm -hmm. just doing nothing. Right, absolutely, but it can't, that can't be sustained. So, you know... Milestones for social skills are not the same for language. So with language, I can literally give you a checklist that you can check off and say, you know, at, at two years old, he should have 50, 60 words. Mm -hmm. And putting two words together, and at three years old, he should be able to follow two, three-step directions. Check it off and move on. Social skills, it's funny, it's not like that. And I think you have heard of, you know, everything I needed to know I learned oh, yeah. from kindergarten. It's essentially that. So all of the things that we learn from preschool to kindergarten or to second grade are the building blocks. You can't check it off. We just build upon it. So the milestones that I'm going to give you for kindergarten to early elementary, it doesn't get checked off. We just say, okay, you know, you need to learn to share. You need to know what delayed reinforcement is, meaning I have to wait to get what I want, and then I'll get it if I do these things. Mm -hmm. You need to start being a good sport. It's hard in kindergarten, hard in first Can you teach that? Sport. You can if the motivation is there. So I always tell the parents that. So I've met children who come to me for social skills, and the child is blissfully happy. Yeah, they don't care if they don't anybody's care. paying attention. They don't care, and those are harder because there's no motivation. But more and more, I get children, especially late elementary, middle school, mm -hmm. that come to their parents and say, I don't understand why I don't have friends. Or I don't understand when everybody is laughing and I don't get it, which mm -hmm. is a language processing issue. I don't mm -hmm. understand when you know, I, I don't want to speak in front of people because it seems off. And so we start getting those children. And those children are motivated because they know that there's They can concern. see a difference. They can see a difference and they don't understand why that is. So when you, you explain it to them and you break it down and you say, look, I can't, I can't make a kid be motivated and want to socialize. I just, I can't. Mm -hmm. But if you want to and you're just lacking the skills, I can teach you the skills. And that's the difference. So yes, if a child is blissfully ignorant and just wanting to be by themselves and happy, it'll be a, a tougher battle. I was going to say, because yeah. there's people, so somebody is sitting here and she just said, oh my gosh, this is my daughter and she doesn't care if people play with her. Right. This is Christina said it and, the, and Susanna said it. Mm -hmm. So what do you do with those kids? How Can you motivate them? Well, it depends. Is it very individual? It's very motivated? individual and it depends on the, the age too. And I think it differs too with boys and girls because we get girls a little bit younger be, uh, by second or third grade parents would come to us and say, you know, she's not getting invited to sleepovers, there's mm -hmm. something a little off, mm -hmm. um, because I feel like girls talk so much and they um, mature in certain ways much quicker. With boys, I think it's always roughly around fifth grade. 
Hmm. Because when they get up to there, you know, they can hang out at somebody's house and play video games for three hours. Yeah, nobody it will know normal. that they were by themselves. I pick you up in the car. Hi, did you have hey, a good time? Great. Yeah, I had a great, great time. time. Didn't Maybe, talk to anybody. Didn't talk to anyone. Great Meanwhile, time. I don't know the last name of the person who mm-hmm. I went to. I don't mm-hmm. know, even know if they have a dog or what he likes. But we played video games for three hours and mm-hmm. it's fine. Mm-hmm. So I feel like those are more accepted with boys so it's a little bit later on when boys are really developing Mm -hmm. true friendships then then the parents start noticing like hold on Mm -hmm. you know Mm -hmm. like it he he has a bunch of acquaintances but no no real real friends friends. so tell me so we know what this kind of looks like in elementary up until second grade okay and then from second grade on to probably like roughly around like right before middle school so something it, it never gets mastered because I told you, you can't check it off. Um, but this idea of theory of mind really um, gets developed. So it's the idea of perspective taking. So before second grade, they think the whole world revolves around them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And But at, about first and second grade, they start getting the idea that, oh, other people are in this world. They it's matter. not just me. They yeah. matter. I have to share with them. I have to compromise mm-hmm. with them, problem solve with them. So this is one of the biggest red flags for social skills. So when I meet a child that has poor or limited theory of mind, it's a big red flag for me. At what, at what age? Like, when is the flag like, whoa, do we have a... Pe- like, first, is it a- first and second grade, you can see it. You can see it without knowing the kid, like when you come in and you evaluate them, or yeah, the parents when, when, can see when it. when they evaluate. So a parent will come to us and say, there's something off, I'm not sure what it is, and then I'll say, you know, what are your concerns? We interview the teacher, let's look through, you know, about um, all the paperwork, let's, you know, let's kind of um, get an idea as far as where the concerns are happening, mm-hmm. and then we start looking into theory of mind, and, and if it's underdeveloped or not there or limited, then we start thinking, okay, what else? social skills wise Mm -hmm. because that plays out I mean we know how it plays out Mm -hmm. it leads a lot to anger because think about it so if you think this is your world and everyone's just in it yeah yeah and then if somebody's doing I know a lot of adults like that right absolutely absolutely and like like I said no checking off right this is something we keep working on until the day we die so if you think this is your world and you know um, they're all just there for you Mm -hmm. if they're not doing something that you want you're angry Right? So if something doesn't work out for you, mm-hmm. you're angry. Because this is your world. It should work out the way. If you want to play football, everyone should. Um, if you happen to hurt someone by accident, who, you know, what does it matter? I did it by accident. He should know that it was by accident. So, so how, oh, these social skills classes that you're doing, mm-hmm. are these common? Like, can people find them in their local, you know, from their local mm-hmm. speech? That, is that where you would go to a speech? Because that would right. not have been my first thought. Is right. my kid is having problems with social skills, I should call a speech therapist. Mm-hmm. Is this common? It is common, but then we're, it's not exclusive to speech therapists. Okay. So I know lots of wonderful OTs that do social skills groups, but those kids typically also have sensory issues. Mm-hmm. So then, you know, the OT, the occupational therapist, um, addresses the sensory issues and along with the social skills. I know lots of wonderful therapists, psychologists, that also have social skills groups, and they come from a little bit more of an anxiety standpoint. Yeah. Right? So mm-hmm. then a child might come um, into their office um, with anxiety, they work on some individual instruction, and then they say, hey, let's try this out with another child. Well, I was going to so, say, mm-hmm. is it always taught in a group? Um, no. So, and again... I was going to say, doesn't that... It feels like it you, you would be. It does. Right? Because so, you'd stick them all in a room right. and just be like, you guys should do this. Well, the goal is always for them to be able to do this with a group. Okay. But a lot of kids come and they don't have the foundations for okay. that. So, it's almost like, I know what's wrong. I don't know how to fix it. Give mm-hmm. me the tools. But I can't give them the tools in front of four other children. Okay. I have to give them the tools in a safe space because a lot of them has, have developed anxiety. Mm-hmm. Um, in a safe space show them how it's done, break them down into pieces that they can manage, practice them, role play them, and then say, all right, let's add a group. And then we do the group and we do this thing called... Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah, like it's, which is an awful, awful name, uh, social autopsy. Why, why would you call that? I don't understand why... No, when you say we add a group, but these are also other kids that have social... Well, that if when you're picking a group, and I'm kind of jumping ahead. Okay. So look into, you know, look into groups. Look into your guidance counselor at school. Sometimes they have lunch bunches, you know, that they can put together. Sometimes it's not always best to have the kids 
be with the other kids who have the same exact issues as them. Because there's no then, What are they modeling? Yeah, there's exactly, no model. right? So you want kids that, you know, it's, it's a lot of handpicking, and that's really what you want. So you don't want to go to a facility or to the school and say, oh, you know, he's nine. We have a Wednesday group from 6 to 8 p.m. for nine-year-olds. Mm-hmm. having never met your child and ha- you know what I mean mm-hmm. it doesn't work like that your child might work better with an 11 year old mm-hmm. or with a 7 year old you know what I mean it depends on what their needs are so a lot of times when you put um, groups together it's a little bit about personality and it's a little bit about what they can get out of each other needs wise awesome so sometimes it's, you know, it, sh- it shouldn't be oh they all have the same diagnosis so we stick them together because then they look at each other going uh. yeah. <laughs> so if you're just joining us uh, this is Sip Share Advocate and we are being joined by Riza Miro Lemonakis. Yes. There it is. And uh, Riza is a speech therapist, but also specializes, we're talking tonight, about social skills. Uh, if you have a question, feel free to ask it. Uh, just keep them short, um, because when there's a lot, Megan might be able to pick it up. She's producing tonight. Um, but feel free to ask questions. Uh, if you know of any parents out there um, that you think would be helped by hearing this conversation, please, you can um, tag them. Just write their names. They'll be tagged or share with them. Um, we're trying to uh, you know, create a program here uh, where we're able to bring experts in to answer your questions uh, and just be able to talk with people. I mean, the only reason I met Riza is because we fought hard enough to say, I think there's a problem. It's been going on for long enough and she was up for her IEP uh, evaluation. And, um, you know, one of the thing, one of the things that, uh, and we can talk about this another time, is to get into some of those um, some of those tests that I think that p- parents don't even Absolutely. know what to even ask for. You, right. you, you think, okay, I think there's a problem. I, you know, we had done a round of tests in fifth grade and they were all screenings and, uh, they said everything was fine. And then when we saw Riza three years later, I was like, it was bad where we were. And I said, well, how does that compare? And you were like, well, for the two tests, it was fine, but she didn't have this third test done. And, right. and it was very shocking to me. Um, why it wasn't done, but we'll talk about that another time. Any mm-hmm. tips on teaching social social skills when they prefer to play on their own terms? Okay, so I kind of talked about theory of mind. So that's one of the basic principles. They have to, they be, they need to be able to understand that there's other people that exist and that other people have different thoughts as they do. Because a lot of the children that we work with that have difficulty with theory of mind, they really think whatever their thoughts are, everyone is thinking the same. So if they like SpongeBob, everyone must like SpongeBob, and that's difficult. The other um, topic, that the red flag, is the rigidity, that real difficulty being able to deviate from what they like. Um, between those two, we, we can cover probably 75% of the kids that we see between the rigidity and the difficulty with the area of mind. So for these kids, yes, you'll always find them wanting and preferring what they like. So it's about getting them to understand that other people exist and that they might not like the same thing. That's, that's got to be so hard to teach. It um, is. Kind of like blue pill, red pill. Right. right. Should I be concerned if two-year-old won't form any words but does form sounds? For a two-year-old? Yes. That a different show, or can I? I, th- I mean, I don't know what you could say beyond that. I'd be like, yes, you should definitely talk to somebody. Yes. Um, and that again, when is it not a mark? A mark. Oh, oh. sorry. Go ahead. So one of the crucial questions with that is that does he or she understand everything that you are saying to them? And if they do, and yet they don't have any words, then it's a big concern. Yeah. In my area, ABA is only offered to age six. What's ABA? ABA is um, ABA therapy, applied behavior. Um, so it's a, a, a specific kind of therapy. Okay. Mm-hmm. I said, is an introvert, hold on, I'm going back to is an introvert the same as someone with social skills no. issues? No. So the first thing that I tell parents when we start going into the social skills journey mm-hmm. is I have no interest in changing your child. If you have a child with social anxiety, they might never be, you know, the life of the party. That's not the point. Mm-hmm. I couldn't do it even if I tried. Mm-hmm. The whole point is giving them tools to be able to function in these mandatory social skill settings and be the best version of themselves. So a child or a grown up who is an introvert and yet can function when needed, is completely okay. Um, I do have some uh, children who can be seen as introverts who are still asking for help. Um, They might not want to be social all the time, but when they are social, they wanna be able to do it appropriately. So my son was told by an ENT that the pressure behind his ears is over 200. They suggest tubes. 
And I guess there's a question after, but we can't see it. It's two lungs. Um, mm. do you, is that is that your area or not really? Is well, that I your would nose need more throat? information. Yeah. Do you have any ideas on building a child's self-esteem that doesn't seem to have any? Mm. Yes. So any group that you pick, any social skills instruction that you get, the building of self-esteem has to be a part of it because this is tough. So for somebody who um, this doesn't come naturally to, it's a lot of work. And it's a lot of work because it never stops. So anytime you're with a person, you have to be thinking, okay, am I looking into them? Am I tuning into them? Are we in the same page? It's just, it's a lot of work for somebody who can't do it naturally. Mm -hmm. And it tends to um, kind of break down their self-esteem if they even have any. So for self-esteem, it's always creating a positive self-image. So I always tell parents, find out things that they like and try to look for something that you can do within the community to do that. You know, so I have kids that the parents say, oh, we enrolled him in soccer because his brother was in soccer. Well, he doesn't do well with a really, really big crowd, really noisy, being yelled at with the coach, you know, and he's not forming any relationships there and it's certainly not helping his self-esteem. But, you know, he does like chess, so try to get a support group for chess, try to get a kid's chess club um, so that it's a small enough group that he can say, oh, I'm good at chess, I have these two other kids who like chess mm -hmm. and build it there. What so is the difference the between positive. sorry? What is the difference between social skills class and ABA? What is ABA? So ABA um, tends to be more associated with children with autism. So um, what it tends to be is that um, it's a one-on-one. -on -one, um, so they they get a skill like let's say following a direction, and then they break it down to the necessary steps to get to eventually following a direction, okay. and then they drill it. Uh, so yes, there's there's a big difference with that. Um, social skills is so fluid that it tends to go beyond ABA, although ABA may be a good start for certain kids, depending mm -hmm. on their needs, yes. It says, any help with a child with a processing issue? That's a loaded question. Yes, it is. We could do like a three <laughs> show. <laughs> we <now>. will, we <laughs> will, that'll be a different show. Right. Because, um, you know, uh, there's language processing, mm -hmm. right? Is there something yes. else? Are there other? Process, or does it all just kind of come under the umbrella so of like processing, processing? Really, you can have a huge umbrella of processing, and you think of all of your sensations. So the way you look, you know, the way you see things, the way you hear things, the way you feel things, mm -hmm. and then with anything processing, then you can have difficulties with processing. So you can have difficulties with visual processing, um, auditory processing, under auditory processing, language processing, mm -hmm. you know, sensory processing. Mm -hmm. So you know you can break that down and we have children who have difficulty with all of that and how difficult is that you know to be always overwhelmed yeah it says so. wish I knew about social classes for my son when he was young he's 20 now with SUD and I can't see the rest of your comment I'm sorry what's SUD I'm not um, sure that I have no doubt was related to LD and social learning problems. Problems. Yeah. yeah so there are groups like we personally have groups of 34 there are other in um, social skills class yeah Absolutely, and there are other facilities. You're gonna have a whole bunch of women sending their them. husbands <laughs> right. to social skills. Be like, you should have bought me flowers on my birthday. You should wake up in the morning, and say good morning. You know, apple tree. It's really funny. You know, we meet the parents, and the, the parents, dog has and, You know, the parent goes, "Yep, I, I get it. I was like that. I am like that. Mm -hmm. You know, I work at it. So yeah, it does happen." Mm -hmm. um, I have a child who has a cochlear implant. Went too fast. Has a cochlear implant. And we love our speech pathologist. Thank you for explaining. I'm, just, I'm not sure if I'm reading the whole thing. Thank you for explaining differences and thank you for doing what you do. Oh, oh substance use disorder. Thank you, Cindy. We're Got all it. learning. Um, Cassandra says yes, can be worked on at any age. Um, do you, so one of the things we didn't touch on is high school. Mm -hmm. Like, are you getting, because I feel like this is such an elementary middle school issue. Mm -hmm. Do you see a lot of kids coming we to you from do. high school? We do. Yes. And what does that look like? So, if it's not you know, for adjust? high school, we always tell parents, you know, your high schoolers can be secretive, but just not detached completely. You mm -hmm. know, so they're not supposed to love you. They're not supposed to want to hang out with you all yeah, the time. Yeah, I mean, it's teenagers, so exactly. you don't know. But at that age, they should have, and we're not talking a million friends, we're talking one or two close friends who really know them. Um, they tend to, you know, look for a role model, so they tend to emulate it, whether or not you think it's a good role right, model. Good you know, they're looking for, mm -hmm. you know, their identity. Um, but again, there's so many kids um, within that grade, within that, you know, four grades, um, that have difficulty. And 
at that age, you are no long. If you bring them to social skills instruction or a social skills group, you are no longer doing things to them like you would be for a second grader. You have to do things with them. With them, it's not. They like have to be on board. They have at to that be on board, right? So pretty much most of the kids that I have with social skills, they know exactly what goals they have. They know exactly what they're there for. They ask me how much longer do you think I'm getting better with that. They hmm. they report. So we do we do a lot more of social skills coaching. And mm-hmm. you were asking, is it always in group? Mm-hmm. So with my high schoolers, half of the time it's not because they want almost a social skills coach. I was going to so, say, I would imagine mm-hmm. they're just kind of yeah. gathering information yep. like if this happens and this happens, exactly. what should I do? And then you can trust them to go out into the world, practice that and come and back come and back. say, that didn't work. That didn't work basically. Or, you know, it worked or, you know, whatever else So Cassandra mm-hmm. says, my entire high school caseload is social skills goals. Wow. Yeah. Son is 18 with executive functioning and ADD. Our SLP is amazing. SLP. Speech language for that. Oh, see, I'm going <laughs> to he, uh, he, can he still overcome this? I can't see the rest. Or will he always have it? So it's one of those things, just because we can't check anything off, if it doesn't come naturally for your child, who is now a grown-up, mm-hmm. it's never going to come naturally to them. But it doesn't mean that they can't, can't compensate for it and they can't right. get better. Grown-ups, typical grown-ups work on this, right? Mm-hmm. Networking, when you're stuck in a cocktail party, you have to, you know, you start kind of sweating and you're mm-hmm. like, oh, mm-hmm. I don't know anybody here. Mm-hmm. So this is something that's just continuous. It's just natural for others and others need to work on it a little bit more. It's funny, you know, a lot of people, I'm, I mean, in real life, I'm a comedian, right? So I'm on stage all the time. But if I'm at a, at a party mm-hmm. and I'm not on a stage, I'm, I'm not good. And, and we were at a conference and I was all these people and I should have been networking. And I just, it was too overwhelming. And I was like, I'm going to meet five people. Right. That's my goal. I'm going to meet five people before I leave this room. And then I can feel like I did my job. But it was like, <laughs> I met like the DJ, the security guard. Like I was just, the I was taking up, I was like the waiter. Yeah, I was like the guy that just walked by with the cheese roll. Like, uh, I think that it's, uh, it's very common. How do I know if it's pandas or sensory seeking? Oh, so that's more towards OT. What's, so what's pandas, pandas is um, an autoimmune disorder. Okay. So, and one of the characteristics for it is sensory seeking. So you would really need, you know, a full workup for that. You'd need, a, you'd need blood work. You'd need to... Um, I don't, what is sensory seeking? So it would be a child who has difficulty with sensory processing. So the things that they can touch and feel. And sensory, do they just get overwhelmed by well, sound? Well, sensory seeking would be actually the opposite. Somebody who wants more of it. So they would be the, the type of children who like to um, get like squeezed really hard like big deep hugs um, some of my kids kind of like bang themselves on the wall to kind of you know get that feeling mm. um, weighted vest and things like that so you would need you know like a developmental pediatrician to head up hmm. the blood work and look at all the There's tests just look at so many things that. that fall under your umbrella Thank word you. final disfluency and non stuttering like disfluency different I don't even know what those words mean <laughs> do you know what those words mean? I do yes <laughs> Um, okay, can you repeat that? My eyes keep oh, going. Oh, they I can't. can't it says word so final disfluency uh-huh. and non stuttering like disfluency uh-huh. difference. So it depends. So it depends on your child. Disfluency in general, you know, disfluency just means that you're not fluent in speech. So it can be from a word retrieval issue. You know, if you have difficulty retrieving all the words that you need, then you're not going to be fluent, which is different from actual stuttering. But when it comes down to it, you just want to know what is causing the stuttering because it's going to come out roughly looking the same. So you're saying find the, find find the, the reason cause. behind it. Right. Middle school age also, also really like real jobs, have them carry laundry to laundry room, these things. Does that make sense? Middle school age also. They like real jobs. Right. What does that mean? Um, just starting to get more independent. So like we have our early high schoolers um, right now for groups. Mm-hmm. One of the things that they're doing almost every week. So, you know, we started assigning um, their laundry, folding. You know, we say, what is your main goal? And their main goal is always to live independently, mm-hmm. hopefully knowing family and friends. So we say, okay, what do we do to, to be able to get there? So we start doing laundry. Then the next week we start doing the dishwasher. Then the next week we start um, grocery shopping online. To practice, you know, do you know how so much So these are spend? other social skills? Mm-hmm. These are all some of the social skills that this, we work uh, on in, ad- in addition to. So that's why it kind of encompasses occupational. That's where this occupational therapy does, other right. also mm-hmm. comes in. Right. Um, so if you're just joining us, we're talking with Riza Miro. Lemonac- Lemonacus. I'm going to get it. I just know where it was Riza Miro before she walked in, but her husband's watching, so to say the last name. <laughs> it's a whole thing. Um, and so we're talking about social skills, um, but also obviously touching on a lot of other things. We're gonna wrap up here in just a few minutes. Um, 
It says, I feel we have to teach basic skills at home, such as good morning and learning to, I can't read the rest, learning to what, to approach, do you see that one? It might be far back, I think I have a lot of, have you used or heard the listening ears program? They have helped our sensory daughter. Um, so there's a lot of cognitive retraining um, programs that are auditory based. So we use other types of programs, but they have similar things and they do help with sensory, yes. This one says, do you find that high schoolers want less services or help? That's what I'm finding with my son. Um, we find that they want no help in school because they don't like being pulled out or being um, kind of um, sticking out. But I find that they don't want less outpatient. So mm -hmm. they just don't want the kids in school to know that they're getting it. So Fianna says, you become a pseudo medical professional when you have a child with issues. I think that's so true. Yes. You know, I, we had, um, I was just talking to somebody the other day and I just feel like if you have a kid that's a little different anyway, like I'll be out and I'll, somebody will walk, I'm like, that kid's got so and so or that kid's got, I, you know, you're just, you just know right. what the signs are right. and I feel like um, what you do and that whole language piece, I think that most, you know, moms, most people can say, something's wrong they don't know what it's called like right. you know what all of them are called right. um but we just know that it's not right and then you know where do you go from there and, um, you know mother's gut is just very yeah. strong you might not have the name for it but you know something's a little off and sometimes it takes a little while to kind of get to the right people and get the right services and ask for help and you mm -hmm. know but you know so April is saying, what's your specialty? You've touched on so many topics thank you very informative yes. so how do you how do you explain what you do in a very um, short, I mean, you're a speech and language pathologist right. So first, right? First, correct. So pretty much anything that has to do with language. And when you think about it, so much of mm -hmm. our social skills is through language. So anything, they, my professor used to say, anything from the neck up. So feeding, speaking, understanding, comprehension, mm -hmm. and social skills, facial expressions, all of those are things that go with social skills. It's a, the, the scope of speech therapists is really, really big, and I'm not an expert in all of the areas, absolutely not, nowhere near, um, and I've had um, you know, families that come to me and say, you know, I only wanna see you and you only your name's on the door, mm -hmm. and then they tell me what their concerns are, and I say, I'm not the best person for that. You know, mm -hmm. I can see you, but you don't want me anyway, mm -hmm. and point them to either you know, one of my other um, colleagues or somewhere else so we can't possibly be experts in everything but you know if I were to um, say the three things that I'm more, most passionate about it's probably language processing social skills and apraxia and so okay so say someone's watched tonight and they say okay I think I think either before this conversation I thought there were things happening mm -hmm. or after this conversation I'm like hey this is my kid mm -hmm. um, what are the best next steps for them how right. do they find um, somebody like you should they mm -hmm. be looking like you're New Jersey licensed board right. certified mm -hmm. and we're looking for that we're also looking for OT what so it depends on so what you really want to do especially with social skills is talk to the people that spend the most time with your children in unstructured settings so if they're in preschool ask you know the teacher that's with them in unstructured settings if you're in elementary school it might not be the, the homeroom teacher it might be the lunch aide or it might be the you know the recess monitor because and you have to ask specific questions. So coming up to a profess to a professional or a staff member who has 50 kids and saying is my kid doing all right? It's too vague. So you know you want to say hey these are my concerns. Can you keep an eye out for my child? Have you seen it? Does he play with anybody? Mm -hmm. You know is he just in the corner? Um, has he made any new friends? Do you find him you know having a difficult time when somebody's trying to change something up? Um, so you have to be specific in what you're kind of asking. There is, you know, schools have wonderful resources. You can talk to guidance counselors. Like I, you know, mentioned a lot of times they have lunch bunches. They can put a couple kids together. They say, hey, you know, we have this special lunch group. Well, what, what do you think? Just to kind of keep an eye out so that they're and you are on their radar. Mm -hmm. um, they, you can ask for a child study team evaluation. Um, you have to be careful with that because, again, social skills is not something you can pin down. I was going to say, mm -hmm. they wouldn't necessarily do any type of testing for Only that. Only if it has an academic impact. And for some of our children, there is. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? They're starting to refuse to go to school. Their, their academic um, performance is actually getting... Um, I, 
it, it's going down or it's not to where it should be. And you said that, you know, that social skills for, uh, for many of, usually is an outcome of something else, something right? Else, Whether right. it's anxiety or learning disabilities or... or right? Yeah, or rigidity. So. so, you know, you can ask for a child study team evaluation. You, you have to make sure that it is a combination of standardized testing and non-standardized testing, especially for social skills. I hate to even give standardized testing, and this is what happens to me all the time. You know, I get a report, and the, the you know the parent says we asked for an evaluation at school. They tried to give it to us. Here's the evaluation and a standardized testing. But to make you need standardized testing just because you need the numbers. Mm -hmm. But for social skills, more so than any other area that we do, you need the observation and you need the non-standardized testing. Because how can you go to a child and say, if another child comes to you and says, hello, what do you say back? Most children will say, hello. Oh. But that child may not be doing that at all in, in real life. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So they tend to always score high or with an average range in a standardized test. Hmm. So you need the other half of that. Um, you can ask for an evaluation um, through that, through school. You can go to an outpatient. Um, but the adults, let's say you know you have a close neighborhood and your child is always across the street. You know, talk to that parent. Tell them your concerns if you're comfortable, and say, "How is he when you're? You know, he's at your house. Yeah. Does he talk to you?" I think kid? I think moms are already, moms already know just by the way their kids talk. When you say mm -hmm. like, "Hey, you know, I saw you playing with Tommy. How's Tommy?" I don't know. Right. You're like, "Well, what's Tommy gonna? Are you guys gonna meet up later? No. How come? Is he doing anything? No. Right. He's not doing anything. <laughs> so when you asked him. Right. He was like, yeah, I'm not going to do anything, right. so I just want to be left alone. Um, do social groups work on eye contact? Um, they do, but don't just focus on the eye contact a lot. Some children, it, it's been such a big part of social skills, but I rarely have found that if a child has difficulty with eye contact, that it improves significantly just because you keep telling somebody, look at that person look at them. It look does. At them. So you should tell them to look at people. But it doesn't. Oh. It doesn't really improve that much because there's a reason why they're not That's looking all the time. Or... Exactly. So, you know, me telling you, look, look, you gotta look, you gotta yeah, look. Yeah. Like, go clean your room. Go clean your room. How many parents say it? They're not gonna clean exactly. Your room. So it is part of it, but there's so many more other things than you can so do. So if you it's focus just... on the social. Right. And a lot of times it's even body positioning. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah, just... I haven't looked at her once. I don't mm -hmm. know if you guys... I mean, I feel... I actually feel uncomfortable not looking at you, like but I know excited, we're yeah. talking to everybody here, so <laughs> right. I don't want to be rude, Teresa, but I was talking to you guys. So, um, so listen, thank you so much for joining us today. Let's hear it for Risa and all of her fabulous information. You can find her if you'd like to reach out and get some more information. You can find her at Risa Miro Speech. Is that it? Yep. Dot com mm -hmm. um, and uh, if not find someone in your community um, whether it's speech therapy occupational therapy guidance office um, you know psychologist psychologist mm -hmm. yeah. do do that work if the, you know something in your gut says hey let's let's look into this I had no idea before we called you know so I had reached out to reason I said hey we're doing the show and we are kind of collecting our experts and Risa was on our team uh, with doing everything with Brooke and uh, you'll see her again we hope to have her back on other subjects um, but when she brought this <laughs> up she was like I have a social a social skills class and I was like I didn't even know that was a thing right. so maybe you're like me maybe you don't even know that it's uh, it's a thing and it's a uh, another resource and that's why we do shows like this um, just to kind of share that information I feel like uh, so much in our journey um, all of our IEP meetings are behind closed doors and people don't want to tell you that hey my kid has this and ironically when I have a breakdown in a CVS parking lot then everyone in the universe started <laughs> telling me my kid has this and I was like why didn't you say anything before it would have takes one yeah and so um, so thank you so much for watching. Uh, stay tuned. We'll be doing more shows like this. Dr. Richard Selznick is dying to come back. <laughs> I think he was just going to try and take Reza out tonight just to get here. Um, I beat and him. Uh, yeah, she did. She beat him at the door. Um, and but stay tuned. We'll have lots of different experts. If you have an idea for a show you'd like to uh, see or talk about or questions you would like to have answers, uh, we just opened an email. It's advocate at 
onefunnymother.com. So you can email us if you have any ideas for shows, if you are an expert and you'd like to be a guest on our show as well, you can reach out to us. Um, and as well, find Riza at rizamirospeech.com. So thanks guys so much. Thanks Riza. This awesome. is fabulous. This is and uh, stay tuned. We'll be uh, doing another show. And Tipsy Tuesday is tomorrow. Yep. For, for those of you where this was a little too heavy, <laughs> you're like, you know what? I want Tipsy Dina back and she'll be back here tomorrow. tomorrow. So yes. thanks guys so much. We'll see you nice. next time.